Hi students, Professor Laney here with Chapter 1, Intro to Child Growth and Development. I'm really excited this semester. Um, this is the first time I've been teaching it in this summer, so it's very accelerated, and so I'm glad that we're in it together. Um, but I've converted all of my PowerPoints into Prezi. So you all have, at every chapter as I'm developing, the option for the the PowerPoints, and you can see the slides, and they're pretty pretty one note. I don't want to say boring because I'm never boring. Um, and then I also have um, the Prezi version of what you see here. And then what I'm doing here is a recorded lecture. So some people are visual, some people are auditory, some people like it in multiple formats. And so I'm hoping that I can, you know, capture all of your learning styles in these three different ways. So let's get started. I need to make sure that I am recording video, but I'm also recording audio just to make sure I have another um, level of recording. And when I mean audio, I mean a transcription, not sound, just my words. So yes. Great. All right. So chapter one, child growth and development, super easy to navigate through Prezi if you can use the click or you can use the arrow keys, super easy. But I wanted to make this like, you know, child growth and development, almost like the picture wall at your grandma's house, you know? We all have different pictures on the wall, and it's different ages and stages in our life, and I wanted to make sure that you could see the way I see it, and I think it's kind of cute, um, but every single chapter's on here. So we're going to start with chapter one, but every single chapter is on here. So chapter one, let's get started. This is the picture that I, I thought represented to me um, the entire like foundation of child development, and there's we're going to get into different things today, but this to me... Is, was like all the different colors and the different ages and people and different, you know, you can't really see if it's a mom or a dad or a parent or a grandparent and different types of kids. You don't even know what the race or ethnicity is, but there is this colorful just love of play. And so that's what we do here. And that's where we're starting off. Um, okay, great. So all of the chapter information, again, is in one spot. And as I add to it, it'll all be on this wall, technically. It's all just like, again, the pictures of Grandma Ma's house. And I want to make sure that um, we cover a lot, but at the same time, it is an intro. I do not read to you. I do not read at you. I know that some people are still emerging our language skills, but what I do here is try to illustrate what's already in the book, already in the Prezi, already in the PowerPoints. I'm trying to make it a little bit more dynamic. So forgive me if I don't read every single thing to you, but I leave enough to where you guys can fill in the blanks because this is college and we're adults. Yeah. Good. So this entire chapter, I'm going to try to format all the chapters like this so you can see the sections that we go over. We're going to talk about the study of child development, influences on child development, issues in development, theories of child development, and research methods. Some of the stuff can be a little bit more interesting, and some can be a little bit more vanilla or bland or a little boring. I'm not going to lie, but I, again, I'm trying to make it dynamic so you can understand it the way that we understand it. As you meet more child development professors, you'll see that we are crazy about this stuff, which is great. So that's what you want in a professor, I hope. So the first section is the study. What? There's so much to study of a child. How much do we do we want to do, or do we want to break it down into easy, manageable sections? Yes, I choose manageable, right? Don't we all? So there's periods of development. Just like you have been through periods in your life. You were little, you were middle, and now you're big, right? So we'll talk about the specific periods, and then there's also domains, meaning areas of study. So let's say if you were like super into cars, um, maybe you're, you're just really into imports, or you're really into four-wheel drives, or you're really into hybrids. Those are like domains, right? Um, so... Periods has to do with times and domains have to do with areas. So let's talk a little bit more here. First things first, what is child development? It could mean so much to so many people, but for the intents and purposes of our class and your degree or how much you're studying here in this area, arena, the scientific study of systematic processes of change and stability in human children. Think about that for a second. Scientific study. This is not just like, oh, my auntie's like neighbor said that that kid has autism. Mm, no, we don't do that. My my neighbor's like friend's dentist told me that um, their kid is like super gifted. Okay, there's a little bit more to it than that, and we will get into that. Okay, 
And again, yes, human children, yes, all animals have children, but we are studying child development. A lot of, every time I get a, somebody who argues with me on this, but, but I said, let's just keep it again to a manageable area just for this class. We have eight weeks. So periods of development, it periods and time in general is a social construct, meaning different cultures and different areas and different societies have a different idea of time, right? Sometimes people really say this is the date and time this happened and other cultures will say something happened and then that happened to be the date and the time. So just to know that when we say periods of development, it is a social construct that we've all created, but it helps again organize the study a little bit easier. Okay, I'm moving my headphones as I go. Okay, good. So again, it's an idea that we can break down human development into different sections, okay? So like in this picture here, this is um, that actor Jim Parsons from, um, oh my gosh, I'm losing my mind right now, from Big Bang Theory. Yes, fantastic. But look how cute he was. He's like an adolescent and now he's an adult. It looks, he's like the same guy, but he's grown up, right? Um, the next area that we have, like, well, let me go back here. So he, in here, this is even before kids are born, right? This is before kids are born. This is just a just gestational period, but it is a period of life. This is also has to do with our chart in our book, okay? Prenatal period is when they're not even born, right? Prenatal. Then infancy and toddlerhood. Look at barely born, infancy, toddlerhood as they grow up. Then we have early childhood, three to six. So that's fantastic. That can go um, kindergarten, pre-K, TK, maybe first grade. The middle childhood, 6 to 11. I have one of those at home. He is 11, and he is really good at it. And then adolescence, 11 to 20. I would like to say that mine is a little bit on the younger side because he is on the spectrum and does have some issues that make him a little bit more on the, I would say, innocent side still. So one day it will be this. But right here, we're right in the middle. So... So if you look right here, the age period, and then we're going to talk next about the domains, okay? The physical, right, the domains, the areas, remember? Physical, cognitive, psychosocial. Physical, cognitive, psychosocial. Physical, cognitive, psychosocial. After Chapter 4, we go through physical, cognitive, psychosocial to each one of these groups. So let's go back here. Look at this. See how it's organized in our book? So prenatal, we can talk about how a baby grows physically, how their brain grows, and any emotional response. Of, Whoa, yeah. Look at this. Infancy to toddlerhood. We talk about their physical, right? When an infant or toddler grows, we know how they grow. Science has shown us how they grow and how they developed. Cognitive developments, how does that brain grow at that time? And then psychosocial, it's a fancy word for emotions. So we're going to go over a lot of this stuff, but I want to let you know there's three domains, physical, cognitive, psychosocial. And if you look on our syllabus, the first four chapters are all foundational. And then look at this after, look at physical, cognitive, psychosocial, physical, co I mean, it gets a little repetitive, but we break it down so it can, we can really study it because each development phase of a child is important and each domain is important as well. Okay, good. So look at that. Again, we know how children grow. Remember how like their head is huge when they're little and then it kind of grows in proportionate and then they get stronger on the bottom and they start to walk and run. Yeah, we know this stuff. We'll get into it. Then their brain, their cognitive development. 90% of a child's brain is developed before 90%. So is it fair to say zero to five is the most important part, time of life? Yes. Okay, then I put this for the like the psychosocial portion, getting along with friends, laughing, developing a sense of humor. This is when they develop a sense of humor and it is so weird and they just laugh at everything. And look at she's even looking at her other friend. They're all smiling, but they have this social emotional context. And we'll talk more about that as well. So that's the study of child development. And now influences. What what influences child development? Do all kids grow up the same? No. And why not? Because it's heredity, environment, and maturation. So think about it in your family. Do you look just like your siblings? Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. I have one sibling I look like, and then I have two siblings that I don't look like. And so that's a genetic kind of situation. My one sibling, we have similar colorings, but the other ones are dark hair, dark skin, dark eyes. 
so we don't we don't look the same. And then the context of development. It's almost like in on which microscope or which glasses are we looking at in terms of child development. Like in different countries, a child when they're eight years old, they become a man when they get their own goat. Right? At eight years old, our kids are not anywhere near adulthood, right? So context, different contexts, different countries, different cultures, different um, ways of looking at it also affects development. Then timing influences, like sensitive times in their life. Again, what if you were, you when you were a toddler, something happened and you weren't able to learn how to walk? Maybe you had a car accident or some sort of like brain tumor or something, and you were just learning how to walk when you were 12. How would that affect your development? Um, likewise, what if you went through puberty at 6 or 26? How would that change things? So again, we'll look at each one of these. Again, domains and different periods. And so it's it's a nice grid that's nice and organized. And so even though we're going to go over a lot of information, you'll be able to get up. So heredity, we know what that is. That's what we get. We've inherited from our parents. Um, that is our genes. We can't get, I mean, I'm, I'm female, I'm this size, I'm this color, there's a few things I can change, but my genes are static, right? Um, environment is, what if I grew up in South Africa? Would I look different? Would I sound different? Would I talk different? Yeah. And maturation. You certainly are not the same person at 14 as you are today. Certainly not, okay? So again, look at this heredity, right? Red hair, it's, it's inherited, right? Um, but you can dye it red, you can take the red away, but it's in your genetic code. And then this is the environment. Look at all the different things that people don't even realize goes into um, raising a child or how a child turns out. I, Like I said, I have an 11-year-old. He's also adopted. So it's one of these things where how do I know what I'm doing to him was something that he would have already chosen for himself had he grown up in a different house. It's a crazy, we'll talk about it more, it's a crazy idea to think would he totally be into Legos if he grew up somewhere else. Right? It's crazy. So there's all these different things like climate and environment and even like pesticides and migration or weather or natural disasters or whether a child grows up in an urban environment or grows up in a rural environment or how many kids in their family. I have one kid. He's an only child. Had he stayed with his birth family, he would have been the youngest of four. That makes a huge difference, right? So again, there's different things that affect child development. Now this is our maturation, right? We all mature, hopefully. Our body does. It's called, you know, time and aging, things like that. But it's interesting because how does that affect? The decisions that come with this version of this guy is different than the de decisions that came with the version of this kind of guy. So again, as we get older, the, that development changes as well. And this is just a sneak peek of brain development. Look at this. Newborn one more nine months two years an adult. To go from this to this is about double. And to go from this to this is about the same. You can see this is a little bit more spread out because between, shh, don't tell anyone, between, a, between a, a before adulthood when there's this teenage years, we do lose some of our brain cells. Yeah, it's normal. And we'll talk about that. So if you think a teenager's out of their mind, you are correct. We will talk more about that. Now, epigenetics is not in our book. And I was just, if you see a blue little square like this along our lectures, that's just my little two cents. And what I did is um, I added in for our modules, I'm trying to put in extra videos and stuff that are cool. They're not a requirement, but these are the things that I've learned along the way that really help take this information that I'm sharing with you and get it in. It's really cool stuff. A lot of TED Talks. Here, let me make sure that I, I publish these here for you. Um, so we'll talk about some of this, these theories over your epigenetics. Just click it, and it's a YouTube video, and it talks about how when you have one set of genetics, and even if you compared yourself against a twin. Oh, Tori Kelly. She's so cute. Big things are happening um, so when you, let's say there's two of you who grew up, and one grew up here, and one grew up in, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, how would that actually change your development? So make sure that you guys do click through these, um, all those videos that I put at the bottom, and I'll give you some other clues about when they pop up and what I added in there. These are all really, really good stuff. I mean, I've been doing this for like 30 years. So... I'm trying to share with you everything that I know just so it makes what you're learning that much more interesting. Let's do it that way.
Okay, back to the presentation. So if you see this, it's not part of the text. It's not. It's not going to be tested on. Nothing. It's just something cool that uh, will I added in just in case you're interested. And again, any of that other stuff, you're welcome to share. Right? I just got it off of YouTube, or I learned it along the way. Next is issues in development. What are some of the issues that that come up when we study children? Because again, all children learn differently. Again. I'm raising a boy, it is a different gender than me, he's mixed race, but we all are in Southern California, we technically have the same temperature, I technically have the same lifestyle as my parents, um, but I had three other siblings, he doesn't have that, like, we are older than my parents, so what are some of the things that are different, besides the obvious, like again, a boy, mixed race, right? Well, what are the, some of the things that are the same that he could have brought? It's really kind of like interesting. So let's keep going. So is development based more on nature or nurture? And let's we'll expand on that a little bit. You, some of you may have heard that in a different class, but let's talk more. Is development active or passive? Meaning do you go out and affect your development or does it just happen to you? Now, is it continuous or discontinuous? Does it stop and go or does it go all the time? Now, an emerging consensus is a fancy word of saying we're getting to an agreement okay so nature versus nurture so like for example heredity is your nature what you're born with your genetics right i mean i have green eyes but i can put colored contacts on that's fine my environment says go ahead and put on colored contacts because that's going to make you look better whatever right so do i am i more affected by my genetics my heredity or my environment so again, so what if I was, you know, I'm a woman here in, in America and we still have struggles, but what if I was a woman in Iraq or Iran or Persia, like modern day Persia, like how is that versus anywhere else on the planet? I mean, it's really kind of interesting. So is development based more nature versus nurture? Like for example, my son, he's not super athletic, but he does go to a special needs baseball and he's pretty athletic for that group, but as for the most part, I wouldn't consider him an athletic kid. He's more of a techie kid. Now, did I teach him to be a techie kid? Or was he already kind of like that in his brain? Is it his nature that he was born with? Or did I teach him all that stuff? Or he just learned it from his environment? We don't know. <laughs> so it's one of these constant con like conversations that people have. People say, no, your nature def defines who you are. And some people say, well... No, it really has to do with your environment. What if what if you were one of those young people who was born and they have felt like they had gender identity and a gender identity disorder and then they lived in with a family who said, Yes, let's let's go ahead and dress you like the gender that you identify with or they lived with a family that said, No, you have to stay with the one that we say. So how how is that development affected? Is it by your genetics or is it by your environment? So it's ongoing ongoing debate. Okay, then is development active or passive, right? Do you go out and develop yourself? Well, I tell you what, I constantly take new classes. I have, I take new classes. I took two brand new classes last week that I had never taken before. A dance class and a painting class. I've never done that. So to me, my development is very active, but some people aren't that active. But does your development happen even if you're just chilling on the couch playing video games? Yeah, it can, absolutely, right? So it really kind of depends really on the person and the situation. And then is it continuous or does it stop and go? I think it can be both, right? But what do you think, right? Is it gradual or, or can you just jump around, right? Does it stop? Does people just show up, bam, or does it just stop, boom? It could be different for any kind of people. Now, quantitative and qualitative, this is your extra bonus for college. I didn't learn this stuff for a long time. Oops. Of course, I get a phone call in the middle of lecturing. Um, and quantitative sounds like quantity, right? So if I was going to have $5 and now I have $10, my quantity of dollars changed. But if I had, um, if I could buy $5 worth of mac and cheese or like spend ten dollars and get a really good like lobster mac and cheese that would be like the qualitative yes i spent more but maybe the portion was exactly the same it just the quality got better so when we look at children it could be like um like something that could change in numbers did they get taller did they get heavier 
Can they lift more? Can they do more jumping jacks? Can they do more pull-ups, push-ups? Quantitative changes, things that can be measured, okay? But qualitative is this child, he's he has become more polite or this girl has become more aggressive and that's a quality, right? She's more sad. She's more angry um, or she's really developing how to study really good, you know, hard and do good study skills. So when we look at kids, we can look at their, has the quantity of that child changed in some respect or has the quality changed in some respect? Okay. Awesome. Let's see. And so this is kind of what continuity looks like. Are you constantly, constantly developing or you just go to one stage and if you don't finish the stage, you, you're stuck or do you just keep going up the stages? And now some theorists will talk about our, well, I guess for you guys, it's this way. Some theorists are like, yep, it's a, it's uphill. And some theorists are like, nope, stage after stage after stage and you have to do one at a time. But you know what? And the bottom line is, they're pretty much starting to get along that some theorists are starting to say, yeah, it's a little bit of both nature and nurture, continuous and discontinuous. So again, just keep it in mind that when we look at kids from here on out, we're going to be looking through these different lenses, these different ways, these different ideas. And then I will ask you which ones you believe in, right? Again, nothing's better than your opinion, right? <laughs> so here's the theories. Psychoanalytic, learning, cognitive, contextual, evolutionary, or sociobiological. Now, again, this is an intro chapter in an intro class. I'm going to give you some information, but I'm not going to hammer it down so hard that you, like, lose your mind, okay? And again, this is just chapter one. We're going to build and build and build from here, okay? And again, you may have heard of these analysts or these theorists in different classes, but it all applies to children. Okay, so our book has the five perspectives here. Again, the psychoanalytic, learning cognitive, contextual, and evolutionary. And let's go through each one. And it'll tell you right here. Stage-oriented, do you have to go through stages? Yes or no, right? What is the emphasis? What are the techniques? And what are the ba basic ideas? And so I break it down a little bit. Okay, so the psychoanalytic, this is Sigmund Freud, right? And you guys may have heard of that. Everything is um, based on our urges or um unconscious processes. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Okay. And he talked most about the id, ego, and the super ego. Okay. The id is like a, a little kid who just wants candy, right? I want candy. And when we're, we're an adult, we go, no, you shouldn't have that candy. It's going to make you hyper. But, you know, the ego on the end between says, well, I really want that. So how do I make it that it's okay. You have like one piece, right? But to mature into that balance takes a while. So Freud wasn't wrong. He just has a really interesting way of talking about it. And he was, yeah, kind of rigid if you look at that picture. <laughs> yeah. Um, so his human mind, he believed the human mind was a lot was under like our concept. Like we know these things, we know our thoughts and perceptions under our consciousness. And then sometimes we have memories and sort of knowledge, but way under here, there's things like, why am I scared of a drain? Or why am I irrationally afraid of clowns? I mean, there's things, maybe something happened when we were younger, right? So things that happen to us that are unconscious, we still react to, is what he said. So here's the id, the ego and see what you're, I want to know. Well, you can't have it. That's not right. I need to do a bit of planning to get it. So what if this is a like a person at a bar? It doesn't even have to be a dude. A girl says, um, I want another drink. And inside, she's like, no, I've got to work in the morning. She's like, okay, how do I make this happen so where I can have a drink and work in, in the morning? Or a guy, his bar is like, oh, that girl's so pretty. I want to go out with her. He's like, no, 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 you already have a girlfriend. <laughs> how do I do some planning to get both of those things? And so, you know, Freud wasn't wrong. So that's just it in a nutshell. His is called the psychosexual stages, okay? And again, I'm not going to really hammer this down, but this will be on some of the quizzes and exams, so make sure you do know psychosexual versus psychosocial, which is Erickson. We're going to talk about that in the next couple chapters. And then cognitive. Cognitive is like the cogs in your brain, cognitive. Piaget, and we'll talk more about that too, okay? So perspective two, behaviorism. Hint, 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 this is my wheelhouse. So... I like all of it, but this is where I live and breathe because, again, I have a child on the spectrum, 
And a lot of times with our, our alternative learners, we need to have a little bit more of a structured way to, um, to make sure that they are learning and reacting and, and developing and socializing as humans. So this is the approach that people only act in a way to get something. Yes and no, I, right? But there's an influence and a reward or an influence, an, in, an input and an output, right? An antecedent and a consequence. So a lot of times, I mean, I could just mess you guys up right now and just say, oh, wow, you know, in and out sounds great, <laughs> right? So now you're thinking, oh, man, I could smell it. I could think about it. I pretend you don't eat burgers, but just the smell is the most fantastic, and I'm going to go and want some too. Um, but there's this thing where you can get somebody to do something based on a, a motivator, right? So if somebody in my house said, hey, I feel like getting burgers right now, I'd be like, I'll go. Like, yeah, there's a natural motivator in there for me. So again, it has to do with the stimulus, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. Okay, so Pavlov was the one, and you may have learned about this in psychology, is that you would condition, you can condition a dog to do certain things, right? Just like training a dog. But what he would do is that he would show them the food, they would salivate, okay, then he would, now he would put a bell in between these things, so he would put the bell with the food, and they would salivate, hmm, now if he takes away the food, and he rings the bell, the dog still salivates, so you've created this conditioned stimulus, and a conditioned response, even though a bell has nothing to do with food, he paired them here, and now the dog's still like, oh, I heard the bell, give me my food, interesting, yeah. So that's just part of it. That's just part of it, right? But here, this is kind of the joke here. Watch what I can do. I, I'll make Pavlov do something. As soon as I drool, he'll smile and write in his little book. So who's training whom, right? When your dog barks at you to put food in their dish, and then you put food in their dish, what do they just do? They just trained you. <laughs> so it can happen. And here's another joke. When Pavlov's dog begs, we'll drool for bills. Ha ha, right? Funny. So again, with the behaviorism, we have this operant condition. We really have this reinforcement and punishment. And this even applies to peers, right? And we'll talk more about that when it comes to peer development and psychosocial development. Peers can be like, hey, you're so cool, be in our group. Or they could be like, mm, you can't wear pink on Wednesdays, right? So there's, there's reinforcement and punishment that helps people guide their behavior, okay? And these are the foundations that you, you're going to hear a lot more about Skinner and Pavlov. Bandura is great. Watson Thorndike is fantastic. Now, again, this is that increased, that increased behavior. It has to do with when you get a reinforcer, when you give something positive, when, right? So let's say uh, my son opens the door for me when I'm going into a store. And I just tell him, oh, that's so polite. I really love it. Thank you so much. You're so grown up. I just gave him like for reinforcers, right? That behavior is going to go up, right? But if I said, don't hold the door for me, what do you think this is? Like chauvinistic pig? I'm a woman. I can do it. Like if I do that, the likelihood of that behavior is going to go way, way down. So, and it's, it's really simple. And again, we're not going to hammer it down too because it's an intro, but I love this. Give me a child and I'll shape into him into anything. So for example, it's summer right now with my kid, and we have chores that he has to do in the morning before he touches a screen. And it's like seven things. And he has been slowly, like, adapting to it. So he has to literally do laundry, read something, build something, an act of t kindness, and one other thing. So, yeah, no, six, seven things. And he'll fight me a little bit, and now... He's kind of like, oh, okay, I'll do it. And even this morning, he did it with a little bit of arguing. And then he said, oh, that was fun. Oh, yeah, we did Mad Libs. He had to write something. We did Mad Libs. And he's like, oh, that was fun. So he's slowly shaping into a kid who's going to wake up, go through his list of seven things with little to no arguments. And there'll be some big ones and some small ones. And that's called shaping. It's like a diamond. We polish it into shape. So slowly, we shape the behavior into the desired response. Because guess what? I don't have to bribe him. I just say, when you're done with the list, you may have your tablet. It's crazy, right? But it works. So again, this is, again, when you're working, um, for some of you who are interested in learning more about special needs and working with applied behavior analysis, that's also what I do when I'm not a professor. We talk about the ABCs of behavior, antecedent behavior, 
antecedent behavior consequence. So inter if you're interested in this kind of stuff, take uh, Intro to Special Needs with Me 205. I, my format's very similar, super awesome. Okay. The next perspective is the cognitive theory. Again, cognitive, cognitive process is all thinking, right? Now, some of you already know you are a thinker, then a feeler. I'm a thinker first, then I feel. Like, I'm the one who's like, oh, I'll help you with that project. And then they railroad me over it. And then later, I'm like, hey, that wasn't fair. And then some of you are like, no way, I ain't helping you. Like, emotional. And then think, oh, man, I could have helped out a little. Right? So for some of these theorists, they believe that if what you think helps develop who you are. So Piaget, this is a big one for child development. It's the first time we're going to talk about it, but we'll, we will talk a lot about it. Uh, let's make sure that I'm still recording. Yeah, let's keep going. There we go. Um, and so Piaget believed that their development has to do with how they think about things and understand their world. And it's initially based on motor activities and biological factors. And it helps organize the world. So when kids are itty bitty, what do they do? They're constantly moving and they constantly pick up something and it goes right in there. Sensory motor. They're moving, motor, sensory. They sense everything. I mean, that's when kids like pick up a handful of dirt or sand and you're like, eh. But that's how they learn about their world, right? Then it goes into pre-operational stage, which sounds kind of stinky, but it's not. That just means their their brain is learning how to operate. And then this concrete operational stage, they can start to manipulate their universe a little bit more. We'll talk more about it. And then formal operations, they can start to talk about and think about what if things that aren't there, like concepts like algebra, love, um, credit cards, things like that. So we'll talk more about that as we go. This is just the intro, right? So again, this cognitive development is, is if you do something good, then that's your reinforcer. You do a task effectively and you learn more and more about your world. Okay. And then again, there's this adaptation between taking the information that you know and getting something new and applying it, comparing it and working it together. So again, this is, this is a way of thinking of assimilation and accommodation. It's kind of funky terms. People get them confused. Okay. So if any of you have been around little babies, they're all really good about like pointing, right? That is a skill, by the way, if children don't point, that is something you want to talk to your pediatrician about. Uh, could it be a developmental issue? So they put, you're holding them and they point. They point at a, uh, an airplane and they're like, what, dad, 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 right? And you say airplane and they go, plane, plane. So you're holding them and like for the next three months, man, that's all. They're pew, 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 every airplane. And you're like, you and me, we tuned it out. We don't, we don't care. But it's new to them and their world is expanding, right? Then what happens is a bird flies by and they go, plane and you say no 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 it's a bird 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 so in their mind they have to take the idea of a bird and a plane and kind of compare and contrast them in their own brain so a bird and a plane they both fly but they're different so they start and then they'll mess it up for a while so next time you see the plane they go bird and you say no 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 plane so they're starting to assimilate new information together right now, uh, the accommodation is really taking your own cognitive structure and saying, huh, uh, I just saw a flying car, so I've heard about flying cars, I've never really seen a flying car, but now I know it's not a bird, I know it's not a plane, we're adult and we can, uh, we can accommodate. Now, little kids, they do this assimilation and accommodation, and as you get more sophisticated in your brain, it can happen faster, right? It's kind of like learning a new language, sometimes it's slow at the beginning and then it starts to kick up. But just think about this one. This, when you're in assimilation, you are comfortable. You're in equilibration. You're just, something's easy for you. And then you have a new situation, and then you're out. You're out of sync. Like I said, I went to two different classes this week. I had no idea what to expect. By the way, I was super sore after the dance class for like three days. Did not expect that. So I had to accommodate that into my learning. Like, oh my gosh, I need to stretch. I need to take dumb down, all right. And then I went back to an, a different art, art class. I've never painted before. It's hilarious. And there's a new situation. I didn't know what to expect. I actually brought my own art supplies. It was so lame. I should have just chilled out. But I didn't know what to expect. So I was in dis disequilibrium. So now that I've accommodated this new information back into my world, look at this. It goes into assimilation, 
right? So that's how kids learn cognitively, and we will get deep into that. Now, Vygotsky, another huge, huge theorist for child development. Make sure you know this guy, okay? He talks about how adults in more sophisticated members or peers can help organize a child's thinking, right? It doesn't have to be somebody necessarily older um, to teach a new concept, because how many times have you helped an old person, excuse me, an older person with a smartphone or a TV, a smart TV, or a v even a VCR or a, some electronics? If you've ever had to help your parent or grandparent with something, this is what Vygotsky says. There's parts of your culture that know things and parts of the culture who don't. And when you work together, you can kind of create these little areas of what you can, well, like what a person can do and what they can't do, but in the middle is what they can do with help, right? So like if I wanted to go run the LA Marathon, yeah, I'm not into the big no, but I can walk, I can do a 5K, but if I trained with a helper, maybe I could do more right? So same thing with kids, tying their shoes, building blocks, doing anything, reading a book. This is called the zone of proximal development. So let's go back. Let's see if I can go back, back. ZPD. Don't forget this one. This is a big one. We'll go over this a lot. Now, if you're confused between Vygotsky and Piaget because they're both cognitive, Vygotsky is, is more of that cognitive with other people and Piaget is just your brain working as it goes so again we'll we'll work on those together but I just wanted you guys to see what each perspective is really all about now contextual perspective love this one too if you're um, interested in if you're just starting out this is like um, child development 110 or at different colleges it's called something else but this would be like child family society so it has to do with the context meaning like Again, where did you grow up? What time? I can't imagine growing up in my mom's time. I mean, my mom was having, she got married in 1966. I had a kid in 1966 and 68. And they were in Europe at the time because my dad was in the military. I didn't have kids that young. I wasn't in the military. I've never been to Europe. I can't imagine that. She had to learn how to take an officer's wife's class where she was required to wear a hat and gloves when she was out in public. Okay. My official statement on that is, no thank you. If I didn't grow up, when I grew up, I don't know how it could have fit. Because it has to do with this context. I grew up in the 80s. I know I'm old. But like in high school, I had this like like crazy poodle perm and wore like bright pink. And, and that was great for that context, right? But I also think of like my mom was trying to pull off the poodle perm and the bright pink. But she was like in her 30s and 40s. Ah, that makes no sense to me, right? So... Our, how we develop has to do with our, our influences and this in the environment. And not just the trees and the birds. I don't mean environment like that. The things that, again, are in your world, in your environment. And this is Yuri Bronfenbrenner, such a great guy. He helped the Head Start program actually become the Head Start program. So, so this is the entire class of like 110 Child Family Society or, again, Child in Society. But, again, if this is the child right here, what are their influences that are every in their everyday world, right? And then as it goes further out, it has less influence, but it also has this influence that goes back in, right? So macro system like economics and politics, kids don't know that, but their parents do, and that does affect the parent, right? So it's all this like back and forth. I call it the kaleidoscope, this back and forth of um, how to like – look at a child in the context of their influences. Really fascinating. Love it. Love it. So if you can take that class with me too, that would be awesome. So again, this is the difference between the genetics and the human culture. We have so many different things. Yes, our genes do play a part, but the human culture has a huge part there. And look at this. Look at all these kids. I guess it says, does it say co Jeez. I, th I thought it was going to say coexist, but look, we have kids, different races, nationalities, there's a job, there's a a wheelchair, we're saying they're having sign language, there's older people, younger people. This is the thing. What if you don't live in a diverse culture? What if you do? How, who does that, how does that affect you, right? So I really like to look at people in terms of their environment. And I think that's a great way of looking at these different ways of child development and the different theories.
Now, last one is evolutionary and sociobiological per perspective. Kind of a combination of the genes and the human culture together. So this is where you're going to hear things like Darwin. Now, I know a lot of people have very like mixed feelings on Darwin, but here's the deal. I mean, these birds evolved, right? Or giraffes used to not be so tall. And why did they get tall? It's so they could eat the leaves on the tree. Because guess what? All these guys, the two of these guys were eaten way down here. And all the good stuff was left up here. So over the course of years and years and generations, they evolved. Even a polar bear is an evolutionary process. Did you know that? Some people don't even realize that. And I'm like, yeah. So Darwin believed that the survival of the fittest means that you adapt to your environment or what? So right now, you might know somebody who's older, who doesn't have a cell phone or a computer or whatever, and they just don't need to adapt, which is fine because people make their choices. And then, and then there's like younger people who are like, oh, I don't use Facebook, I don't use Insta, I'm putting my phone away, blah, blah, blah. And that's great. That is their adaptation. But I guarantee you there's people who are still getting a hold of them, right? Okay. So again, there's choices and then there's consequences to all these different adaptations. Some people say that the smartphones make people dumb and some people say you're not smart if you don't have a smartphone. So again, it could go either way based on opinion. But this ethology and evolutionary psychology really means that our brains are working faster, more efficient. They're different. That's why there's so much more autism now. Things are different. So again, these theorists say that our children are who they are because of this evolutionary process. And again, if you go back and look at that video um, that I talked about earlier, it's really kind of cool. It talks about how what your grandparents ate, of, like fed themselves, affects you today. Yeah. And what you're doing now affects your grandchildren. No joke. Go back and read that one or watch it. It's really cool. It's like 10 minutes tops. But again, we, if you've ever taken an anthropology class or any sort of gerontology or any sort of psychology, sociology, anything, putting those all those things together and then talking about child development makes, makes kind of makes sense that we are who we are based on all of these things, right? It's never really just one thing anymore, right? It's a combination of a lot, okay? So this last part that we're going to go over is research methods. Now, if you are going to go um, keep going with your education and go up to your bachelor's level, I did get my bachelor's degree at Cal State Fullerton. There was an entire class just on research methods. My undergraduate was in sociology. So just to let you know, <laughs> there was a good 14 weeks just on this little bubble. I'm going to give it to you in like, <laughs> like a minute and a half, right? So there's different types of data. When you're like observing a child and trying to figure out, again, do all boys weigh this much at this stage? Or does sugar make puberty faster? Or does dairy products or soy? Like, there's different ways to research to make your research really clean and provable and scientific. Otherwise, again, it's just, it's just conjecture and conversation. And he said, she said, and that doesn't hold any water, right? So let's see. We have research methods, right? On hypothesis, it's just an educated guess, right? This is... This is how an hypothesis works. Like for me, like I always wonder, um, what, is the, what is one that just showed up the other day? It, oh, it was something about the World Cup and there was like more arrests or something or uh, something about more DUIs or something during the World Cup. Like not during the game, but like right after. And it's like, I wonder if there's a wonder and you can do the clinical research, go for it. You know, it might be something that's really, really important can change mankind. Not so much about the drinking in the FIFA, but it happens, right? So we have this and then we, we get this hypothesis or this idea together and we try to research it, right? Um, I have a, a personal a personal theory that says that people with larger front teeth are more intuitive, just because I've noticed that in my travels on this planet. And I usually ask, you know, just someone just a little bit bigger, you know, not, not like mine are, because I don't think I'm that intuitive. But I see people that are just these natural empaths and intuits. And I, and I always ask him. And so, and I've had a few people say, well, yeah, how did you know? And I said, well, I have a theory that this is, this shows that. And that's just me, you know. I'm crazy, but that's my little personal theory. Maybe you have some. Maybe you'll be a scientist someday, right? And then when you communicate the findings, that's like your research paper and things like that. So, again, there's ways to prove anything, right? Like um, 
like I showed you the picture of the redheaded family. Did you know that redheads take um, anesthesia different under s surgery? And so there can be more complications. So I've had um, doctors ask me, are you a natural redhead? I'm like, sort of, but not like a real, real ginger redhead. So because if they miscalculate your anesthesia, then you could die. So it's these things that it took a theorist to understand this and then do all this data collection. Okay. Now, there's ways to collect data collection, right? There's you have somebody report on themselves or you can ob observe them. You can observe them in their natural environment or in a, like a clinical laboratory. Right? Either way. It just depends on what you're looking for. If you're trying to test like the validity or something of, uh, well, let me go back, of, of like a medicine, you want to have it in a very clean laboratory. You want to go through all the steps and I'll talk to you more about that. Um, so basic research design is a case studies, right? And it, sometimes they are really an in-depth study of a culture. So like, for example, you can be a participant, right? Have you seen this like where people go and they participate and then they, they give some information about the room, but sometimes they're just not participating but observing. So for example, is this guy participating or observing? Yeah, he's participating. I mean, he's got a hand around him. I mean, and they're like really connected. So, and they're both smiling. So I'm wondering, you know, if he observed for a little bit and then was a part of the group. Oh, here's, I have a dog who's barking too, so sweet. And then Jane Goodall, we've all learned about Jane Goodall. She's right here, she's just observing. But we also do know that she has participated and they really assimilated her into their world, which is so sweet. But she's just observing and she's writing stuff down, right? So it depends on what you're studying. She's looking at the qualitative aspect and this, the sociology or the, the connectedness of these primates. And so she doesn't have to be in the mix. But this guy, I don't know what he was studying exactly, but, you know, and, and our our participation or observation does change the findings. So we have to be clean about that if we're really trying to do a good study. Now, if we're looking for correlates, like if I said, um, like how we say like um, blondes are more like airheads or whatever, I could say, okay, for let's say one part of the country, let's say in like Arizona, there's a lot more blonde hair dye sold in Arizona. Does that mean that there's like a lower IQ in Arizona? Well, let me find the correlation. If this is, I, there's a lot of hair dye sold and um, then IQ went down this, I mean, it looks, looks like it's going up, but that means like as more dye was being sold, the IQ went down. <laughs> so that means it's, they're connected. It's a positive correlation. And then this could be like, oh, I dyed my hair blonde, but I got smarter. So that, that didn't really work, right? And no correlation whatsoever. So a box of hair dye in your IQ probably doesn't have a correlation. There's no trend line, okay? So again, those, those are sometimes people find those things out. Now again, there's experimental groups and control groups. And so how do you know a drug works is if you give it to everybody, right? You don't know if it's gonna work for some people or it's not gonna work for other people. You have to have very specific control groups. So for example, like, some people say, oh, your hair's going to grow this much longer, or your plant's going to get this much bigger. Well, you have to take two of them and put it on one and compare the growth, right? Or use it on one side or on a different person and compare the growth, right? So again, make sure, and this is a kind of a joke here. And this is the control group where we keep on 200 <laughs> um, centiliters of decaf latte. So it's the rats that are controlling us, right? And could you imagine if you switch somebody's regular coffee out for decaf? What a study that would be, right? Now, basic research design, we talk about independent and dependent variables. Now, it's one thing, like, again, my body's, I mean, let's say I was going to take a test about, I was going to use a product that was going to, like, make my skin darker or lighter. Um, it was, it's not going to change my gender. It's not going to change my age. So the independent variable is what affects the change in the dependent variable. So we have ones that we have variables that stay the same and we have variables that change. And so what happens is that scientists and theorists can change one over the other. So for example, if you're studying children and you put on the fire alarm, well, you have one room of children and let's say you've looked at them for five days and then on the fifth day you put on the fire alarm and see how they react. That's going to show you what's going to make a more emotional response or not. Some kids, that'll bother. Some kids, it won't. So you have like two separate times where you've seen them on one day, regular, and you've seen them on another day with a fire alarm on. And then you can compare and contrast, right? Again, there's cross-sectional, longitudinal, and sequential studies. Like it looks like this. So for example, 
Um, I did work for the U.S. Department of Education where we followed a group of uh, junior high school kids all the way up to high school and watched their math, helped teach them algebra. And so we could compare, right, this cohort, did their, their age went up, correct, and it was a longitudinal study. Now, cross-section means that in 2008, I got an 8-year-old, a 6-year-old, 4-year-old, 2 year right? And in 2010, I did the same thing, boom, 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 boom. Right, and so you see, in 2008 there was only one trend line, and in 2010 there was two. Right, isn't that cool? So you have different groups over time, and then you have different groups like a snapshot. Cool, yeah. Um, and then the ethics. I think we should talk about ethics first because this is this whole thing about privacy, and I don't know what this thing does. Does it do anything? No. Um, privacy and ethics about research because there's people doing re online research about all of us all the time and sometimes we give our permission sometimes we don't know we are and sometimes we're not and they're doing it anyway so ethics is a huge deal so this I think should be first when it comes to research methods okay so that was that whole thing on research methods. now look at that chapter one so this again is the intro to our book the foundation everything that we talk about from here on out is gonna have to do with the periods of time prenatal or like zero to three early childhood middle childhood uh, adolescence we're going to go through all of it right we're also going to talk about the cognitive section of children the cognitive domain we're going to talk about the psychosocial domain which is like emotions and we're also going to talk about the physical domain so again watch this as many times as you need go ahead and look at those supplementary videos that I put they're super awesome and make sure that if you have any questions, um, put that in the question discussion board. You're welcome to reach out to me. I do try to get you guys to help bounce off questions with each other so you have that ongoing learning as well. So again, chapter one, great place to start. Keep up the hard work. This is going to go really fast, so let's get it going and keep on moving. This is Professor Laney. I will see you guys in the virtual classroom, and keep on keeping on.